And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh. And they probably are nasty and harsh. But they're also probably true. And you need to bring those up to the forefront and deliver the message. And it's not straightforward at all because agreeable people do not like conflict. Not at all. They smooth the water. You know, and you can see, you can see why that is in accordance with the hypothesis that I've been putting forward. You don't want conflict around infants. It's too damn dangerous. You don't want fights to break out. You don't want anything to disturb the, the relative peace. You know, and if you're also more prone to being hurt physically and perhaps emotionally, you also may be loath to engage in the kind of high intensity conflict that will solve problems in the short term. Because a lot of conflict, it takes a lot of conflict to solve problems in the short term. And you know, if that can spiral up to where it's dangerous, which it can if it gets uncontrolled, it might be safer in the short term to keep the water smooth and to not delve into those situations where conflict emerges. The problem with that is it's not a very good medium to long term strategy. Right, because lots, lots of times there are things you have to talk about because they're not going to go away. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want. Because they're so accustomed to living for other people and to finding out what other people want and to trying to make them comfortable and so forth that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own desires as they move through life. And that's not, look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. Kind of understand that. Now the advantage to being agreeable then is that you're good in teams and you're very much likely to give other people credit. The bad, the downside of being agreeable is that you're not very good at putting forward your own interests. You know, again, this is a hypothesis in development, but I think what's happening is that, you know, your, your temperamental proclivity allows you to lay out a kind of radical simplification on the world. That's part of the advantage of having a, a temperament. So if you're a conscientious person, the world is a place to go out there and work. And if you're an open person, the world is a place to go out there and discover new ideas and do artistic things. And if you're an agreeable person, the world's a place to go out there and establish intimate relationships. And they're simplifying perspectives they're, and, and simplifying personalities. They're, they're the manner in which you're adapted to a particular niche. So all of the most agreeable people are women, and all of the most disagreeable people are men. And the thing is, the extremes are often what matter, rather than what's in the middle. And so one of the ways that's reflected in, in society, by the way, is there's way more men in prison. The first thing is, if you want to be criminal, the best way to do it is to be really low in agreeableness and really low in conscientiousness. Because low in agreeableness means things are for me and not for you, and you're not going to get me to do a damn thing that I don't want to do, and I'll stand my ground. And low in conscientiousness means you can do all the work and I'll sit back and take the benefits. And so if you have someone who's really disagreeable and really unconscientious, you have someone who's starting to border on psychopath. And if you add high intelligence and high emotional stability to that, then you have someone who won't work but will reap the benefits, who doesn't give a damn about you, who's assertive as hell and who's smart. And a person like that's also going to be charismatic because extroverted disagreeable people are kind of narcissistic, but they're They'll put themselves forward strongly, and if they don't show any signs of fear, that also indicates that they're confident, and it's easy for people to confuse that with competence. And that's how psychopaths get away with what they're doing, although they have to move from person to person because their, relation, their reputation will track them. So, okay, so agreeable people are compassionate and polite. What are disagreeable people like? They're tough-minded, they're blunt, they're competitive, and they won't do a damn thing they don't want to do. So it isn't exactly that they're aggressive, although they will push you the hell out of their way if you're in the way. They're not, they're not like volatile like you are if you're high in, in, in neuroticism. It isn't defensive aggression, it's more like predatory aggression. It's dominance behavior. And so for someone who's highly disagreeable, they look at the world as a place in which they can compete and win. If you ask a disagreeable person what what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want, and this is how I'm going to get it. Because they'll tell you things, not only will they tell you things you don't know, they'll also tell you how to see the world in ways that you don't see it. And they'll also have skills that you don't have, that you could develop. So, for example, if you're an introverted person, it's very useful to watch an extroverted person, because the extroverted person has ways of being in the social world that aren't natural to you, that you can use as, to improve your toolkit. 
And if you're disagreeable, one of the best things to do with disagreeable people, especially if that's alienating them from other people, for example, because it can, you know, people treat you like you're a selfish, arrogant son of a bitch, and maybe that's because you are. It's like, okay, so what do you do about that? One of the most uh, promising treatments, let's say, for that is get the person to do something for someone else once a day, just as a practice, and learn how to do it. Maybe you can wake the circuit up, you know, if you think that it's lying dormant in you, which is probably right. You know, I think we have a very wide range of propensities within us. Some are switched on, genetic propensities. Some are switched on, but I think that if you put yourself in the right situation or walk yourself through the right exercises, you can switch some of these other things on as well. But it takes work and, and, and dedication and discipline to do it. Right? You shouldn't work at cross purposes to your temperament because it's just too damn difficult. But having done that, then you should work on developing the, the skills and, and viewpoints that exist in the space opposite to your personality. Because that's where you're fundamentally underdeveloped. And that way I think you can extend out your temperamental capability across a wider range. And to me that's roughly equivalent as bringing a richer toolkit to each situation. You know, so if you're hyper extroverted, you should probably learn to shut up at parties now and then. And listen, just to see what's going on, to see if you can manage it, you know. And if you're introverted, well then you should learn how to speak in public. And to, and to learn how to go to parties without hiding in the corner and saying nothing to anyone. You know, and if you're agreeable, then you need to learn how to be disagreeable so people can't push you around. And if you're disagreeable, you, learn, you need to learn how to be agreeable so that you're not an evil son of a bitch, you know. So, and the same thing applies even in the conscientious domain. It's like if you're too conscientious, you need to learn to relax and let go a little bit. And if you're unconscientious, it's time like, get out the Google Calendar, man, and start scheduling your day, right? And beat yourself on the back of the head with a stick until you're disciplined enough so that you can actually stick to something for some length of time. And not living in absolute squalor, which is something that would characterize someone who's very disorderly, for example, because they just... They don't notice. It doesn't bother them, disorder. It's like, it, maybe they can see it, but it doesn't have any emotional valence, and so it doesn't have any motivational significance. Agreeableness is a very difficult personality dimension to understand, I think. Partly because it's difficult to dissociate from neuroticism, and, it, and as well from extroversion. Because agreeable people like you, and so that kind of sounds like extroversion. And disagreeable people, sound like they're hard to get along with, and they sort of are. But people who are high in neuroticism are hard to get along with too, and they tend to be volatile and irritable. And so, most of the time if you're engaged in a contentious issue with someone, and emotions flare, it, it usually has more to do with trait neuroticism than with disagreeableness per se. 